I'm going to talk not at all about my farm in this talk. I'm going to talk about a research trial I'm doing with a couple of other farms. So this is uh, as part of my day job, I guess. Um, evaluating and demonstrating weed control options for direct seeded fall vegetable crops. That was the title of our research proposal. Uh, unlike, I think, probably most of the other talks that have been in this track, um, this is a SARE partnership grant. Um, so not a farmer rancher grant, but the partnership grant is something for uh, with an agriculture professional, so an extension agent or someone uh, to work with a number of farmers. I think the minimum number is three, at least we've got three on our grant, um, and try and, and do maybe some of the, something similar to maybe a farmer rancher grant, but try and solve some problems, um, help farmers. Um, so this is, these are the partners. Um, Everyone else was busy this weekend, so they didn't come with me to talk about this. Um, but so we've got uh, Jill Elmers in the back here of Moon on the Meadow Farm, uh, Jen Humphrey and Jess Pearson, they are the Red Tractor Farm, and uh, Kevin Prather and Jesse Asmussen of Mellow Fields Farm. Um, so all three of those are um, within, let's say, a 15 mile radius of Lawrence, Kansas. That's where I'm from, Douglas County, Kansas. So uh, a little bit west of Kansas City. Um, a variety of different things that they do. Um, we're talking mostly about vegetables. So all three of these operations are certified organic vegetable producers. Uh, the Red Tractor Farm also does some goats. Uh, but that's sort of the, the scope of diversity. And the, w the way this project came about, so this is a two-year research grant. Um, we just wrapped up year one, um, so uh, unfortunately I'll, I'll skip ahead just a little bit. I don't have a, any real conclusive data. I've got some sort of initial, uh, initial findings and um, some ideas, uh, but we haven't wrapped up both years of our project. Uh, but the way this came about in 2017, so uh, my background, I had been a farmer for um, at that point about 10 years in that area. I uh, got hired on as an extension agent, so in the fall, um, I, was, I was talking with uh, representatives from these three farms, and they were really complaining about a problem they were having that fall, so this would have been um, 2017, um, and that was uh, that they were having a lot of pigweed growth in their fall direct seeded vegetable crops. So these are things that are, you know, small seeds, uh, densely planted, um, and they didn't know exactly what to do with that. I mean, that you know, obviously you can go out there with a hoe or you can try and hand pick it or do something like that. Um, but so they, they had this problem. Well, basically this, this runs down to in the fall um, in our area, probably up here too, uh, we grow a lot of the same things we do in the spring. So, you know, greens, spinach, carrots, beets, radishes, all those kinds of things. Well, in the spring when you're planting that, the soil temperatures are relatively cool. Um, so you get kind of a jump against some of the really aggressive annual summer weeds. But in the fall, when you're planting those in August, um, all of those really aggressive summer annual weeds, especially in our area, pigweed was the, the one that they named over and over again. Um, so I should say probably in case someone has a different idea of what pigweed is, I'm talking about like amaranthus reflexus or, you know, an amaranth family. Um, but those germinate more quickly than the vegetable crops. They grow more aggressively. Um, so they can provide really, um, really dense competition. Um, yeah, so many veggies germinate and grow more slowly than weeds. And the crops that really are troubling for this are crops with a real high planting density because it's hard to get in there um, and deal with those weeds anyway except sort of hand pulling them, which isn't really an economical solution. So in sort of an ideal world, you know, people want to grow crops like this. These are all like nice, densely planted rows of greens in this case, or they want to grow beets, or they want to grow carrots, things that are densely planted, and they, get ton they were getting tons of pigweed in them. So yeah, to summarize, you want to grow something like this, and you get something like that. That is not red leaf lettuce. That is a field of pigweed, literally. So there's one older plant here, but everything else you see that's red or green there is a little baby pigweed. Um, so you can see, uh, 
I think I've got one more here. This is actually a, an ornamental amaranth that I just put in there because I don't, I guess I realize when trying to put this together, I don't take enough pictures of weeds. Um, but this kind of illustrates the point I want to make. Um, I learned in my first year of farming, a mature pigweed plant will put on about 900,000 seeds and they will remain viable in the soil for up to 15 to 20 years, depending on the conditions. So if you let a few of these grow, or you let a few of um, these guys go to seed, I mean, you're looking at a situation where that's like common. Um, and so uh, a number of these farms uh, probably in the past have had less than ideal weed management strategies. And you know they have persistent weed problems with pigweed, among others. Um, but so what's the solution? So that was my job as an extension agent. Farmers come to me with a problem, and I'm supposed to help them figure out the answer. Um, so for organic growers, they can't really spray an herbicide. But I think what's kind of interesting is even for non-organic growers, um, there aren't a lot of herbicide options because you're talking about broadleaf weeds growing in broadleaf crops. Um, sometimes uh, not so much with pigweed, uh, but if you've got lamb's quarters or something else, that's like in the same family as spinach. So it's really hard, even in non-organic systems, to use chemicals. And in organic systems, um, you know, the only herbicides that are out there are broad spectrum. They kill everything, and they're not very expensive and very expensive. So um, nothing really to spray. So going through the literature, um, it seemed like the consensus recommendation was this idea of a stale seedbed. Um, and a stale seed bed is basically you prepare um, your, your planting bed as you want it. You do things uh, to encourage the weeds to germinate, uh, maybe irrigate it and let it sit for a couple of weeks. Um, or if you get rain, just let it sit. Let the weeds germinate and then you kill those weeds. Um, and ideally you have depleted the weed seed bank enough that subsequent crops um, won't have to suffer that pressure. So, you know, there's a question there like, well, how do you do that? I mean, that's sort of a generality. How do you terminate those weeds? Um, and that was really the, the question that, w that I was kind of left with. I didn't know what to recommend to them, like what's the ideal way to do this. Um, specifically also, um, I think the ways that, that are uh, commonly done are very tillage intensive, so really disturbing the soil. Um, and we don't want to do that. We're trying to help them build soil health, but also, um, we, don't, we want to minimize the disturbance because we don't want to bring up more weed seeds lower down. We want to kill the weed seeds that are in that germination layer and not bring up more. Um, so we put together, uh, you know, not knowing the answer to that question, not knowing what to recommend to them. Um, I wasn't familiar with the SARE Partnership Grant at that point in time. Uh, I was familiar with the Farmer Rancher Grant, so I, I started looking at that. But on the website, I found this partnership grant. Uh, which seemed like this was really kind of an ideal fit. We had farmers with a problem, um, sort of unclear what the right solution for them was, um, and we could help them by doing some on-farm trials. And, and, you know, not only those three farms, but pretty much everyone I know uh, that grows any of these fall crops has these problems, you know. Weeds grow fast, especially in the fall. Um, so we, we narrowed it down to three crops that they were... Uh, routinely grow that really were the most troubling for them. Um, so that includes beets, carrots, and spinach. Um, spinach, they have probably the most density in planting. The carrots are really problematic because it takes a long time for a carrot seed to germinate, so you have a lot of chance for the weeds to get a head start. Um, and beets, I think that was more of a, a consequence of that particular year, but that was a crop that they were really having a hard time with that year. Um, as part of this grant, so we want to try different techniques to control weeds in those specific crops, uh, monitor changes to soil health, um, and monitor and analyze the amount of labor time needed to do these different techniques, because there's a lot of different ways you can kill these weeds. Um, the implements to do them have variable costs. The amount of labor time it takes to do that has variable costs. Um, so trying to figure out what all of those are to help them come up with what the best idea is. Um, so breaking that down, um, we came up with a few ideas for different ways to terminate weeds in this stale seed bed technique. Um, so the three options we came up with are occultation, um, flame weeding, and using a power harrow. Uh, I'll have a few examples of those um, so you can see what, what I'm talking about when I talk about each of those. But then there was this thing that I guess isn't so new, but it's new to 
to me, and it was uh, relatively new to them, that isn't really a stale seed bedding technique, but might help these densely seeded vegetable crops compete against the weeds. Um, and that was this paper pot transplanter, um, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about. It was a two year grant, and I, I, here I say it's for 2019. Um, so after we submitted our grant application, um, they pulled the registration for the paper pots and the paper pot transplanter for the National Organic Program. So last year, none of my growers could use a paper pot transplanter and be certified organic. Um, they reversed course on that in October. Um, the gr I, I wanted to change the tr and try something else, and the growers like, we really want to try that. Don't take it out of the grant. I bet they'll change their mind, and the NOP did. Um, so this year, we are going to try a paper pot transplanter, too. Um, so occultation is basically covering the ground with something that is opaque, encouraging the weeds uh, to germinate, not find light, and die. This is sometimes I hear people use this interchangeably with solarization. They're not the same technique. Uh, solarization, you use clear plastic or clear glass or something that allows the sunlight to pass through and you're cooking the seeds. This isn't cooking them, it's letting them die by not getting light. Um, so that's the first technique we, we decided to try. Uh, flame weeding is the second technique. Um, and so this is a, a flame weeder here. Basically, you're just uh, passing some burners across the bed. Um, so you make your planting bed, you let the weeds germinate, you cook them. Um, so that's what we got there. Oops. And uh, that's not going to go, maybe. I have a video here, if I can, maybe if I hit play here. Sometimes it works with my butt. No, oh, I guess not. Um, anyway, that was just uh, showing the flame weeder going across a bed and cooking a few weeds. Um, what you want with this, you know, you've got four burners um, on that one. That is a, a farmer's friend pyro weeder. Um, you've got four burners across the front, so it does a 30-inch planting bed. Um, and what you want to do, you don't have to, like, roast the weeds and, and blacken them or char them. Um, you just pass it really quickly. They'll turn a slightly darker shade of green. And what you've done is you've ruptured their cell walls. The water inside the cells is boiled. You've ruptured the cell walls um, and they have died and you can move on. Um, so it's a pretty quick process. Uh, here is the second uh, option. This is a power harrow. I've got a video of it next to which, oh, it does work. Awesome. So this is behind the tractor. Here's someone videoing it. So this is just a, a small implement. It's a power harrow. The difference between this and a rototiller, uh, which is what the farmers had all used for this kind of, um, some of them had maybe experimented a little bit with this so pseudo stale seed bedding, uh, but they would use a rototiller for this termination step, which is mixing the soil this way, bringing up more weed seeds into that top germination layer. The power harrow has little hands like this that turn around. So they're rotating around. They're not mixing soil layers. So they're killing, they're disturbing the soil at the top level, uh, killing any weeds that are in there. Um, and actually, if you look at this, uh, you can kind of see there were actually a couple of sort of more mature pigweeds um, that you drove over. If you do those and you get rain in the next couple days, those will probably survive. Uh, but anything smaller than that will die when you disturb it that way. But you're not bringing up more weed seeds into that um, planting area. So that's kind of the critical piece of that is how do we kill these weeds without bringing up more. Um, and here's the paper pot transplanter. Um, this is a picture I stole from their website because I don't have a picture of it in action because we just got it in December. I have a picture of it sitting in my office, but that's a little less interesting. Um, so this is uh, basically, if you're not familiar with it, a tool from Japan. Um, so you have a prepped bed or a bed that you're ready to plant into. Instead of a regular um, you know, plastic 10 by 20 tray, uh, or with plastic cells, you have a 10 by 20 tray and it's got paper cells in it uh, that are actually connected in one long chain. Um, so they look like individual cells, but it's a chain that wraps this way. Um, you start sticking that into the ground. There's a little shoe here that cuts a furrow um, and that chain just moves down. So you drag it to the end of the row and it plants a chain behind you. So the problem with these vegetable crops that we're interested in has been the planting density. So the, the issue of 
how do you deal with the planting density uh, versus the weeds? Well, this is a way that we can densely plant transplants in an economical fashion um, so they get a head start a above the weeds, um, but you know, you wouldn't want to do that with some of these like beets or carrots or spinach um, just with hand transplants. I think the labor and the cost to do that would be kind of prohibitive, uh, but this is a way they can do it quickly. So um, the weeds, you know, are started behind the, the plants have a good leap. So you don't have to wait for the seed to germinate while the weeds are going. Um, they've got a head start is kind of the theory on that one. I'm sorry, so you can do this with carrots? Yes, people do that with carrots um, and beets. Uh, the, the problem sometimes with carrots I've read, and we haven't tried it this year, so we'll see if this is an issue, um, is if you have a heavy soil, um, so they hit the bot, they start growing, they hit the bottom of that transplant, and then they fork. Um, but, so we'll see if that happens. Some people have that experience, some people don't. Um, but like I say, we haven't, um, yeah, we haven't grown with that system yet. So um, one of the challenges we have is I don't have any real harvest numbers for you on yields today. Uh, most of these crops are grown or a significant portion of them are grown for over winter harvest. Uh, so they started harvesting the spinach in the fall. Um, but the carrots and all of that, they'll harvest in the spring. So I'll have harvest data on any variable yields um, coming up this year. Um, we didn't do the soil health in 2018. Um, I, when I made my budget, I basically decided that the soil health testing I was going to do was, to, was for organic matter. So I put in money to run organic matter soil tests on these trial plots. Um, after I did that, I decided that wasn't a very good test for soil health. Um, and so we're going to, we save the money and we're going to get more expensive tests, um, but we couldn't do both years with that. So we'll have those again for this year. Um, but so I'll talk about the results we do have um, from the three different farms. Um, so farm one, uh, I would say, uh, was a, a bit of a disappointment there. So they planted spinach and beets um, and they lost the beets. Uh, but on the spinach, there was no significant difference in the labor time to manage weed post-planting uh, between the control, which is what they've always done. Um, they also did the flame weeding and the power harrowing. So not every farm, this wasn't replicated on every farm. Um, different farms are doing different techniques and um, different crops. So they didn't do carrots, um, but they did uh, spinach and beets. Um, and there didn't seem to be any real visual difference in weed pressure. I'm guessing there's not going to be any yield difference either. So basically that one was a wash. Um, farm two, uh, I'll just put up pictures of all this in a minute so you'll get a little better idea what I'm talking about. Uh, farm two in general uh, had what I would call inadequate weed control um, and faulty experimental performance. I thought we had uh, gone over this, but they didn't really do the control correctly, so they just had a, a treatment. And so they did occultation on carrots, um, and from my perspective, there were too many weeds in the carrots to really call it a success at all, but they did say they had less weeds in the carrots than they have in the past, um, but there wasn't any control. They didn't leave an a untreated area. Um, and then farm three, uh, we did have some significant visual difference in the performance of the two techniques. Um, so they did occultation, power harrowing um, on carrots and spinach, um, and they noticed the differences most in the spinach. So occultation, they had the best results, um, power harrowing. So here's farm one. Um, here's pictures from the three different trials for their spinach plot here. So here's one trial, one trial, and one trial. So these are three different treatments. Unfortunately for us, this is the power harrow, which seems to have the most weed pressure. I don't know if you can pick that up in the back, but there's a lot more little tiny green dots, which are the weeds, um, than on this one, which is the flame weeding. And the one that looks the best is the control. So <laughs> this is exactly what shouldn't happen. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, about some interesting things about this in a second. I'll do sort of a review of, of what I learned. And there's some interesting reasons that might contribute to this. Um, and uh, if I want to give you a little teaser that might be a hint is like none of these are, none of the little green dots that are there are pigweed. So it actually controlled pigweed, um, but not some other weeds. Um, so here is farm one, uh, what that looks like. So these are those three beds, um, actually in the different order. 
So that's the, the control, um, the flame, and the power harrow. Um, so no, no noticeable difference, basically. Um, they did harvest this for a fall CSA, um, and they've got the beds row covered. They'll harvest more in the spring, so that's when I'll get my total harvest numbers off this. Um, here's a, a close-up. Um, so here's the spinach. Here's a, another row of spinach. These are the same treatments. That's not difference in treatment. Um, just this is the edge. And these little dots here, that's all henbit. Um, so a, diff a different weed than we were expecting. Um, so here is farm two. Um, so I think I've got, yeah, there are carrots here. There's a row of carrots there and a row of carrots there. Um, they use, oops, they use this occultation. So here's um, like the tarp like they used. They had just done it on this section and they moved it over there. Um, so both of these rows had been treated. Um, and actually the difference here, these rows go all the way down there and the difference that ends right there is this is how far they hand weeded. Um, you can see they, again, don't have a lot of pigweed, uh, but they do have so much grass that it doesn't really even matter or foxtail in there. Um, but so this is uh, something where we need to figure out a, a, a better strategy um, or a different strategy or something else to help with this problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, and they, yeah, they actually, I think theirs were actually down for six weeks, um, but one thing we noticed, I'll talk a little bit about, is there's a, we've noticed a little bit of effect, and I ha didn't do, I didn't think about this, so we didn't do enough research to figure it out, but a difference in tarping with the white side up or the black side up, um, and if you do the black side up in the summer, um, rather than killing the seeds, what happens or what seems to happen is it almost seems to force a dormancy. Um, so the seeds don't germinate. It gets too hot. The seeds don't germinate and die. They just kind of go dormant. You pull that off and they're ready to go once they kind of wake up. Um, that's sort of what seemed to happen. But, um, so I just had made a sign. They had a field day out there. So I just threw this in here. Um, talking to, to passers-by about occultation and stale seed beds. Uh, here's farm three, the carrots. Um, unfortunately, they're not planted all right side by side, uh, but here's the control. Um, these two rows were done with the power harrow, and then this one is done with occultation. Um, you can't really tell on this. The farmer says this one d is doing the best so far, um, actually had better germination, um, even though it, it received a little bit less water because it was under the tarp, um, but, but something about that helped the germination. These are taken in uh, October after we'd already had a, a little bit of time after a killing freeze, um, so which you probably can't see because the, the resolution on this uh, screen isn't great, uh, but if you look down here in the control and it looks like maybe there's some kind of straw mulch or something like that, those are all dead pigweeds um, that died when it froze. Um, you can see these rows look a lot cleaner on the sides. Um, this row's a little bit cleaner. Um, these plants are a little bit further along and, and fuller, uh, even though it doesn't quite show up here. Um, but so according to, to, you know, sort of field observations, um, right now, this one is doing the best, this treatment in terms of weed control. These two are much better than that one. So this one is actually working in the way it's supposed to, unlike the first farm. Um, and yeah, kind of excited about this. So the carrots will be harvested this spring. Again, we'll see uh, what those results are in the spring. So ob observation, r right now I don't have any clear winner to say like this is what the best thing to do is or this is the best way to do it. Um, we have a lot to learn, so you know some of those like the timing of the tarps is is something that um, you know everyone in this trial is new to all of these tools or growing systems, uh, so I think we do have a lot to learn about all of them. Um, challenges also two thousand and eighteen was hard. Um, a lot of years are hard, but where I was at, that was especially hard i 'll talk a little bit about that, um, and then learning new systems, figuring out you know we have some observations about occultation and some timing things uh, that maybe will inform what we do next year. Um, yeah, and then measuring soil health is, of course, um, a, an ongoing challenge, finding reasonably priced ways to do that. Um, so here's a sample. I just want to talk a little bit about 2018 being hard. Um, so here's sort of the, the log um, of farm one. 
So it says first attempt, July 17th, prep two beds covered with tarp. Um, August 9th, they prep the rest of the beds they're using. August 17th, uncovered two tarps. Uh, August 18th, fertilized all the beds. 19th, they power harrowed um, and rolled with power harrow to incorporate and they flame weeded at that time too. And then August 19th, they planted spinach and beets. Um, and then September 10th, tilled all beds due to low germination and high weed pressure. So the initial planting of this farm was a total failure. Um, and here's my guess as to why. So this is the US drought monitor, August 14th, so the week before they planted that. Douglas County is right there. Um, we have growers in my county that have been doing this since 1980 and say this was the worst year they've ever had. So nationally, uh, we didn't hear anything like we heard in 2012, but where I was at, it was every bit as bad. Um, so in spite of irrigation and all of that, uh, the first planting of those fall crops just didn't take actually on any of the farms. That made the occultation trial hard because um, the, the, the first farm that only did the power harrow and the flame weeding that I showed you farm one there, the reason they didn't have an occultation trial this year is because they did it for their first planting, but they didn't have enough time for their second planting to leave the tarp down for um, even four weeks. They planted again about two weeks after they tilled that stuff up. Um, so that was definitely a challenge, um, figuring out the timing of that system. But, the, you know, this was not, like, so they planted, irrigated, but the, the soil was just too hot, I think, for a lot of those crops, especially spinach is pretty sensitive. Um, yeah, on occultation, um, like I mentioned a minute ago, there were some, like, we had some observations, but not enough, I don't know, science to put behind it, that there might be some difference. Um, so people use the silage tarps uh, that are white on one side and black on the other side. And it seems like in the summer, like I mentioned, if you put the black side up, it gets to, it's not as hot as solarization, so it doesn't kill the seeds, uh, but it seems to not uh, get them to germinate and then die. So they don't germinate. You don't, it's not hot enough to sterilize the seeds, so they're just still there waiting uh, once you pull the tarp off. Um, so you get a delayed germination versus a termination if you do that. Um, the other thing um, that was, a, was an interesting observation that I hadn't thought about, uh, but two of the farms had problems, the two with lighter soils had this problem um, with this occultation, and this isn't from one of those farms, I put this in here. When you get rains, the moisture gathers and ponds on that tarp and that's heavy, and so they'd have these localized areas of compaction um, in beds that were more or less ready to plant. Um, so they had a problem with that. So there would be places where it was nice and ready to go um, and other places where it would be like tamped down from the weight of the water that had stood on top of that tarp, um, which is also not something I had thought about prior. Um, and yeah, I think you mentioned the timing can be challenging, getting them down early enough so that they kill the weeds. Um, and then for the second planting, like we didn't have enough time to to readjust to the sort of failure uh, due to that, that dry heat wave that we had in the summer. Um, so that, that, as a sort of research project, occultation seemed to create some, some fits for us a little bit. Um, so yeah, looking forward to 2019 is my overall concluding thought. Um, you know, if you're considering doing a, a SARE uh, farm, farmer rancher grant uh, or any other kind of things, you know, doing multi-year projects is good because, you know, something almost inevitably goes wrong. I, I've reviewed a few scientific papers that people have submitted and there's always like, oh, well, we couldn't get data from the farm this year because it flooded, you know, there's always something. So giving yourself some time to adjust to those challenges. Um, so what would I do differently? Um, thinking about that in that light. So I would probably would redesign the experiment um, to, to look at a slightly different thing rather than just looking at different uh, Stay, different ways of terminating the weeds, essentially. Um, I saw some research presented by Mark, and I'm drawing a blank on his last name, from University of Kentucky, um, that talked a lot about the effectiveness of multiple passes in stale seed bedding. Um, and so I probably would incorporate something with that. So his numbers, and I, these are probably not exactly accurate, but roughly. So they would do a stale seed bed, make the bed that they're gonna plant, 
um, and do something to terminate it. They were actually using mechanical cultivators. Um, and so if they did one pass, so two weeks prior to planting, they build the bed directly prior to planting, they, they terminate all the weeds that have germinated. Um, they would get about 70% weed control. Um, if they did two passes, it would be about 85. And at three passes, um, they were at like 94% weed control. So the, the critical variable might not be which way do you kill the weeds. Um, it might be really how many times do you do that, or maybe you do three different ways. You know, I think there's a lot of variables there that are interesting that I hadn't considered when we put this proposal together. Um, I think I would have thought a little bit more about the, the timing on the tarps. Like, think about what are you going to do when that fails. Like, so maybe we would have had m m multiple trial beds getting ready. So if one of them doesn't work, then the next one would be ready. Um, so thinking about that in sort of experimental design, um, try and imagine what the, the worst case scenarios are. So it's like, what would you do if you had a you know, record setting drought? Um, you, know, you can have some predictable responses to that. I hadn't really thought about that in depth. I was just like, well, we'll plant at this time because that's more or less when you plant fall crops and we might you know, fudge it a couple weeks either way depending on the, depending on the weather, you know, because fall weather in August is always a little bit variable, but not so much like, well, what do you do if it totally fails? What are you gonna, how are you gonna back up with that? Um, you know, the, the one farm that didn't actually do a control versus a treatment, um, so make sure, you know, I thought we were exceedingly clear about that, um, but just make sure everyone is really on board with all the different steps. I know a lot of farmer rancher grants also have a number of participants. Um, I've been on one of those before too, where there were some people that kind of went their own way. And so, you know, making sure everyone has buy-in and is doing the same project is good. Um, and I probably would have increased the testing budget for soil health. So those are kind of my like uh, takeaways at this point. Does anybody have any questions or? The question was, what's the cost of the power harrow? Um, I think it ended up being with shipping $3,500. Um, so relatively expensive, and it had, that was something that had gone up by, uh, they raised the price by $500 between when I submitted the grant project and when I was approved for the grant project. I was able to find some extra funds through my office to kind of smooth that out, but it was, that's something else I didn't mention is like, you know, in grant you might think about things might be a little bit more expensive than they are when you price them the day you're or the week or month before you're getting the proposal in, because it is, but so it's relatively expensive. There are a number of them. So that's a tractor size model. I originally wanted to uh, get a smaller one that would have been cheaper that would go um, behind a, a BCS walking tractor. Um, the, because I my office has a BCS, so I could take it to the farms and l help them. But uh, the challenge with that was the farmers said, we don't use a BCS on our farm. If we're gonna do this, we need a system that works with our systems. Um, so that was a little bit of you know, back and forth between us and ended up with the tractor tool. Um, so yeah, that was that. The uh, flame weeder, there's a couple of different models. That's the uh, farmer's friend pyro weeder, which I think is maybe on the higher end. Um, and that was like $900. The tarps, um, that for large tarps, but it was kind of the, the pricing for the amount of ground they needed to cover was right, it was like, I think those were like 150. You could, if you knew where you could find used silage tarps, they, you could probably get them a lot cheaper, but. So the question is, what happens with the equipment at the end of the grant? Um, that is a really good question that we didn't think about when we wrote the grant, but my understanding is that it all stays with the farmers uh, because they have a need for that. Like in, in my, yes. Um, yes, that's right. So, um, so the tarps, we, you know, we didn't get one tarp to share, so they each have their own tarp, uh, but the other equipment, um, and they, they'd worked together before on some, they, they already share some equipment, um, but yeah, so that's the understanding, but I hadn't really thought of that until it was like, and it was like well, does my office, oh, well, we, but we don't need any of it, so yeah, that, that's what we came down with. So the question is on the paper pot transplanter, you're seeding and germinating in the paper pots. And the, yes, that's correct. So um, I, should have, I should have brought these, but um, the paper pot transplanter is like seven feet long, so it doesn't fit in my car, but I could have bought the pots. They come in these little things and you spread them out. They're like slinkies. Um, you spread them out and then they have special flats that'll, or things that'll hold them open. 
And so you put it, so you plant in there, yeah, so it does take that extra step um, to get them started rather than seeding them in the field. So that kind of goes in there um, in, in terms of the time calculation, you know, is this an economical weed control technique? Um, and as, as far as I know, there's been a number, uh, there have been some other Sarah Farmer rancher grants that have experimented with paper pots. Um, but no one, and some of them have looked at plant quality, different issues, but no one's really looked at the weed control, if that's, so it might not be an economical way to do that, but it, maybe it has other benefits. We'll, we'll see. So price. They are pricey. Yeah, so the paper pot transplanter, uh, the machine itself is like a thousand bucks with all the little accessory kits, um, some enough paper trays for us to go through this experiment um, at three farms. I think we ended up around $1,500 was the total budget for that item. So, th so that's not, a, none of those are, are cheap solutions really. So um, hopefully they're effective. So the question is what was the change with the NOP program that the paper pots are now allowable? Um, okay, so to take a step back, m my understanding is they originally had some problems with the glue that would join the paper together, um, and my understanding is they were scrambling to come up with alternate solutions, but before they did that, um, there was just a bunch of petitions and things, so the NOP reconsidered it um, and basically decided that it wasn't that bad. So they're not new paper pots as far as I so know. This has happened in the last it, happened in October or November, yeah. Really? Yes. That's crazy. That's awesome. So it was like, uh, you know, in January or whatever, they banned them. October, they reallowed them. So they are... They started selling them like crazy. What? They started selling them like crazy. Yes. I mean, they're, they're becoming really popular. A lot of people were using... There was a, a ton of farmer pushback when they banned them, I think was probably the critical variable. So the question is, on the soil health, are we looking at the, the problems within each plot um, in the soil health, uh, or are we looking at something else? So I think what, what I'm looking at, what my goal was, is to, is to look at which one of these techniques more or less does the least damage to soil health. Um, so not looking at like, what is this, not from today, what does this plot need to do to have healthier soil, um, but from the beginning of the season to the end of the season, which one of these techniques did the least damage to the, the soil health, so, or ideally improved it the most. But, you know, given that I think none of these techniques really are probably on the, like, they're not really building soil health. You know, you're crisping off weeds with a flame weeder. You know, that's any organic matter that's on, you know, so it's like, uh, but you're maybe doing less damage than tillage. So trying to figure out how to, how to measure that was the problem. But yeah, there are, there are different challenges and, and probably, um, yeah, working with soil health and organic vegetable production is something these folks all need to work with. And that's like sort of, yeah, everybody needs to work with. But yeah. yeah, so the question is, am I uh, familiar with the work of Elaine Ingham and how varial, various soil, uh, fungal and bacterial communities and, and maybe uh, using compost tea as a way to, to remediate that um, could help control weeds. I wasn't familiar with that. I mean, I'm familiar with her work generally. I didn't, I didn't really know about the weed. Yeah, so I haven't, I haven't read about that. Um, I, I have, I guess I don't know the specifics on that. The, uh, I, I'm also responsible for produce safety education, so uh, compost teas have, depending on how they fit into that, have, okay, without any uh, microbial additions to stimulate growth. So there, yeah, there, there are some issues with produce safety and microbial teas, so. The, the, the other thing I would say is like, uh, yeah, I mean, both of these, far or all three of these farms are dealing with pretty high residual weed pressure um, from a number of years of, you know, letting weeds go to seed too much. Um, so this, this is something that, you know, probably one year is not going to win the battle on any of it, but hopefully they can move the, move the bar. So the question is, how did the farmers hold down the tarps? Um, so they use sandbags around the edge, but just filled with soil. So they don't fill the sandbags with sand, but just get empty sandbags and scoop. 
and it doesn't really take a lot. The tarps are reasonably heavy. Um, they are all using raised bed systems, so they, the ends sit in a trough, which is probably important. Uh, um, we're in an area of high winds, as probably is most of the state of Nebraska. So, um, yeah, I mean, but, and then especially if you get a little rain, I mean, they'll have lots of weight on them, but I didn't see any of them moving. So, unlike row cover or something like that that wants to go, this does not. So there, there are two questions. One, um, am I familiar with work about what uh, weeds tell us about soil conditions and maybe how to treat them by uh, changing soil chemistry? And two, uh, in cold weather, do the plants have more sugars in our area? Um, so for the first one, I am somewhat familiar with some of that research. Uh, unfortunately, like we started out really specifically focused on pigweed. Uh, and the work I've read on that's like pigweed is a weed that means you have good soil fertility and it's, it's easy to kill, uh, which is true. It is easy to kill if it's not like densely mixed in with your seedlings. Um, so yeah, I didn't find a lot of, um, a lot of solace there. Um, I did want to make a comment since you said the thing about mice. Uh, when I threw out that 900,000 number and like the 15 to 20 years, uh, there is a lot of research on what they call weed seed rain, which is kind of a scary term to me. Um, but uh, so those seeds don't all live that long. It just sounds really terrifying. But you know, there are mice and other insects and things eating the seeds so, um, and birds. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to throw that in. And then on the, the sh plant sugars in overwintered crops, uh, yeah, they tend to be a little bit sweeter, I think. So, so some root crops, if they will last the whole winter, um, if you can get them to overwinter, yeah, they have, they're pretty sweet. Or even spinach, I, maybe, I've, I have not done testing, um, but yeah, it tastes sweeter to me in the, like March, if you have stuff that's overwintered versus stuff that you get harvest in September, October.